We're live and wow, man, has got a lot of red that. hair all of a sudden. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> One moment, folks. I've got to fix some technical problems. Um Hey, uh, welcome everybody uh, to the next episode of Wizards of the Couch. Uh, thanks for joining me, Danny Grimes, and my three fellow couch wizards and gaming ve veterans that are sprawled on the virtual couch, talking RPG games and gaming in general. So we're going to have a couple of drinks tonight, as usual, and we're going to have some great discussions. Uh, just want to make sure that everybody knows that it's an adult show. So we drink, we swear, we encourage you to do the same. Uh, please follow us in the comments and, you know, keep it civil, but don't don't worry about keeping it uh, child hey, proof. Uh, and uh, I'll just go first, I guess. Uh, I'm Danny Grimes. I'm a professional convention GM, a maker, designer, illustrator, and uh, I'm going to kick it over to Matt. This is the best intro or best starting uh, video ever. Do you think, think so? I had red hair for like a minute. You had hair. <laughs> awesome. I had hair, period, for a minute. Uh, yeah, so my name's Matt. Uh, I am the owner of Cobalt Con. And uh, tonight I'm going to be drinking a rather expensive old stock ale, 2017 Cellar Reserve from uh, North Coast Brewing. It's Ryan, not I'm gonna oh, shoot brutal. Old stock ale. Uh, $24 this bottle was, so I'm hoping it's good. Why did you do that, Brian? Brian, are you a trained professional? I'm just checking. You're next. Who are you, Brian? Tell us who you are, Brian. Okay, good. I'm glad you guys could see me because I accidentally yeah, touched did. my screen and probably jacked everything. Uh. <laughs> Brian is that guy. That's who Brian is. <laughs> Fucking Brian. This is... Uh, Wow, I was just making fun of you guys. Mm. Yeah, that's, 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 what that's what you get. <laughs> so now everyone knows who I am. <laughs> yes. like that guy. Uh, I'm Brian Berg. I'm an author, game designer, and director of operations for Wizards of the Couch and Total Party Kill Games. Also, that guy that you've seen at every convention ever. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's. I mean, do I really need to go on? It's just no, it's a train no. wreck from here. From Please don't. Let's kick it down to Jimmy Duffy. What do you think? Are you, are you drinking anything tonight, uh, Brian? Oh uh, yeah. What are you drinking, Brian? While I'm working on this. You no, know, I'm glad that you guys asked. <laughs> I'm uh, gonna have a delightful Static. rogue dead guy ale, which uh, there you go. is on point for me as Total Party Kill Games. So also happens to be a delicious, tasty beverage. And as I was telling these guys earlier, I waited all night today to have my first beer. So cheers. Uh, but it thank you for make sharing that special better. moment. Special cheers. moment with us, Brian. I have no idea Jimmy? where everybody went. Yeah, whatever. Uh, hi, folks. I'm Jimmy. Praetors Rejects. Twitch channel, DM, streamer, content creator. One of the wizards here and the technical brains behind this disaster you're looking at right now. So while I figure this out, bear with us. So I guess, you know what? We're just going to cut right on over to our guests because they want to be seen too. And this is, oh, my Lord. <laughs> well, Beth, Beth has been invisible for... yeah. You're awesome. Just my hair all over the place. <laughs> I think somehow we special affected your hair over onto Matt. <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? Yeah. <laughs> if it makes you feel any better, guys, the audio of this is going to be fine. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. I have great trust in all of you. <laughs> oh, <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. Bad move. Bad move. Not a good bet. <laughs> Um, tonight, we are welcoming uh, uh, two people, uh, Stephen and Beth, and uh, I'd like to just do a quick intro because honestly, there's a lot, these folks are involved in a lot of really cool things in the gaming industry, from uh, Beth's involvement with Penny Arcade, which is one of the longest uh, running uh, uh, entertainment uh, properties in terms of getting cartoons out there, comics, and so on and so forth. Uh, I I was unfamiliar with it, so I'm learning a lot just in the last uh, in the, in the last couple of weeks. And Stephen uh, has a long history as well, so I'm just going to kind of go through some of this stuff. Um, Stephen started way back in 2000 at Polyhedron and uh, did a lot of work on Polyhedron, Living Greyhawk Journal. Those among us who've been playing for years know what those uh, those uh, are. 
And uh, he joined Paizo in 2010, and he was the designer and senior designer on Pathfinder and eventually on Pathfinder 2nd Edition as well. And uh, if you've ever used the flip mats, uh, he created a bunch of the flip tiles for that as well, designed those. And uh, recently, he has left Paizo in the Pathfinder uh, product and now he is freelancing doing uh the delve role-playing game and uh we'll have some information that doobly do where with urls and stuff so we can find that and uh i think one of it i think he he mentioned this to me or i saw it somewhere that uh he uh kind of dreams about doing a drunk history episode if anybody knows what this is uh drunk history is amazing you should look it up and check it out where he talks about the history of D D and Gary Gygax, and uh, I know enough of the history to know how insanely hilarious that would, that would be. Uh, and then shifting over to Beth, Beth Damis is the CFO of Penny Arcade, uh, which means that uh, those of you who love those comics and the convention appearances, uh, she is the person who kind of keeps the lights on and makes sure that all that keeps happening. And she obviously works with a really great team over there, and apparently on Tuesdays they have an event uh, called, what's it called, Beth? There, there's a show that we stream called Acquisitions Intoxicated. So we drink beer on Tuesdays. It's bring your liver day. Yeah, see, they're, they've been doing this for a while, guys. We really should have been studying that playbook because this whole drinking online is, I guess, nothing there, new. There's the missing hashtag, boys. Just saying. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Uh, <laughs> and... Uh, and so uh, we're also here to talk tonight because, uh, and some, some of the things we're going to talk about as well, uh, Beth's daughter is a huge fan of Pathfinder, and I have daughters who play role-playing games too, so uh, I'm kind of interested to talk about how that family dynamic in gaming uh, kind, of, kind of works. Uh, I know how it works in my house, but I'm always interested to hear other parents who have that same thing. So, big intro out of the way. Welcome, Stephen and Beth. Thank Hello. you. Thank you. Oh, clap, clap. <laughs> that was very good. Yay! Welcome to the couch. <laughs> so we kind of we kind of start out with three standard questions, but we realized that these questions are probably a little bit slanted. So I did a little rewrite on them, and I'd just like to ask each one of you, like, what is? Can can you talk just briefly about what your positive relationship is to gaming? Like, what's the positive aspects interacting with the gaming community? Uh, uh, Beth or Stephen, either one. Well, I was prepared for the other three questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, what got you into gaming? Tell... What got you? What got you into gaming? What got you into gaming? Hot boys. To see, that's that's your relationship to gaming. Hot boys. Mm -hmm. Hot I I boys. was in junior high school. I was a big old dork. I didn't have a lot of friends, and I had an older sister that played D and D with hot boys. So that I played D and D and Top Secret. And not they not the same type of gaming groups I had at my school. That's I'm about for to sure. say. <laughs> right. Boys were these. <laughs> in fact, uh, my my DM from high school and junior high met Stephen before Steve and I had our first date. That is true. Oh, yeah. oh wow. Yep. So is that somebody you still hang out with then, or still know? Uh, he actually lives in Colorado. I tried to get him to go to Colbocon. Um, hopefully, we can get him out there one of these times. Oh, fun. Yeah. yeah. I hear that's a good one. It's a great show. It's the best show. So he's constantly sending me funny messages about how I'm wasting my life because I'm living in this magical realm of Wizards of the Coast and D and D, and he would rather be here as Stephen's girlfriend than myself. <laughs> well, we're not doing that. Well, I have some follow-up questions, that. Beth. Uh, uh, but, but I love Coley, but no. <laughs> Yeah, I found too. Uh, you know, those early uh, those early uh, uh, years when I played, it wasn't just the nerds, uh, the classically developed nerd. It was also metalheads. Like yeah. lots of lots of rockers also played D and D uh, because they were deceptively smart people who yeah. appeared like slackers, right? But they were yeah. nerds, nerds nonetheless. Um, we, we've all seen my high school photos, right? Uh huh. Yeah, I have sure I didn't have that actually on stock. Could you have that in uh, any of that on the stock photo, Jimmy? <laughs> yeah, just, just like that. in like. Uh, <laughs> okay. we'll, we'll, we'll so what? So what about later. you, Stephen? Like, what? What? What was the? What was that thing? That magnetic pull? 
Uh, I had just moved uh, to the Bay Area of California. I was about 11 years old and, uh, of course, didn't know anybody there. I'd been living on the East Coast, and I ended up going to a uh, birthday party of my father, who was a federal cop, one of his cop buddies. His son was having a birthday. Um, and, you know, I thought I was just going to get cake and ice cream. And they sat me down and shoved a character sheet at me and showed me all these funny dice. And we played uh, Steading of the Hill Giant Chief as part of the Against the Giants. Right I had on. Nice no start. idea what I was doing. Loved the hell out of it. And I went home and tore out all of the stuff from my. I, I stole every die from every. Uh, uh, board game I had at home, tore out my <laughs> battleship things to make a makeshift uh, uh, GM screen and started writing my own rules because I didn't have any rule books. And I, uh, I, I, I've just been crazy about the games ever since. Yeah, <laughs> that's a great, that's a great maker story, right? You just couldn't, you didn't have the stuff, so you just made it. Yep. It's yeah. funny how intoxicating role-playing games and, or fantasy really is. We could, we could delve into the psychology of that some other episode, but that upon yeah, words, truth there. The, the agreed, elf. agreed. And so, like, what would you, like, what was your, what's your best experience in gaming? The favorite thing that, like, if you could distill it down to one or two episodes, like, whether it's in-game or not, or just people you met talking to, like, what, what would you say, Stephen? Um, I've had so many really good experiences, like not only uh, beforehand with the various groups that I ran uh, before I went to college and then in college, but then afterwards going and, uh, you know, uh, within the RPGA, I met a lot of uh, great people through that and still lifelong friends. Um, my, I, I think my biggest thrill is uh, after I got laid off from Wizards of the Coast, a group of us decided that we were going to play the D&D Championship. Um, uh, I had been involved early, early on, on designing some of the D and D championships. And I was just like, I want to go actually play this thing. And now I can, cause I'm, I'm just kind of a private citizen. This is the period between, uh, uh, leaving Wizards of the Coast and joining Paizo. And, uh, our group, uh, actually won the championship. Oh, nice. And, uh, um, out of like. 500 players i don't know how many how many different groups and everything else and so i've got basically a, a trophy now that says at least for one small moment i was king of the geeks yeah right on <laughs> that's why we're dating and apparently his status as a hot boy oh yeah that too <laughs> yeah yeah let's not overlook let's not overlook that yeah, sure. so so beth you're you're at a lot of you're at a lot of shows you're at a lot of conventions like what stands out to you maybe it, you're interacting with gamers uh like what's that standout moment for you uh everyone that i've met so far is just a really great human and i feel like at least from my experience with these people everybody is open to getting to know me regardless if they know who i am or not and there's a certain speak that y'all have and and you have this secret language, right, that, that you can communicate with each other. So some of my favorite things at the office, there's, there's two favorite things I have. My favorite vision is watching Mike and Jerry sit on their couch in their office and just play video games together and laugh and be friends. And then my favorite listening thing in the office is walking through the office, listening to people creating their characters or their monsters or talking about the next show coming up. And it's just always... Hmm. It's always positive. I know there's a lot of shit on the internet because I've gone down those rabbit holes and read them and, and been very pissed off at fans. Um, but there's so much good. And and it's it's exciting to be able to see anybody be creative in it. Yeah. I think the, uh, yeah. The, the internet's just kind of the trash can. I agree with you. Every time you meet somebody face to face, it's always... It's so yeah. different. Yeah, and, and, I do, and I do think there's something special about role-playing gamers in addition uh there's the lack of in some ways there's a non-competitive aspect even when people are serious they're not really competing so much so people don't right. get quite down into that same level of shit talking that sometimes they do <laughs> but boy put them behind a screen with nothing but a keyboard and uh the sometimes that facade really disappears but i i agree i've never had anything but positive interactions with people on uh face-to-face uh, -face really um so uh you know, I think what we're going to do, we're just going to take a second right now just to tell everybody that this is Wizards of the Couch.
Uh, we're on Twitch at twitch.tv slash Widgets of the Couch. You can see us on Facebook. We're on Instagram. We're on Twitter. Uh, we're doing this show like every two weeks, but we are going to have a show again next week, uh, back to back to catch up from the Gen Con Slack. And uh, just want to let everybody know, find us everywhere as Wizards of the Couch and uh, check out our shows, like, share, subscribe, do all that good stuff. So I guess that takes us into kind of the beginning discussion of why we're here. Freelancing, publishing, making cool ideas come out of your brain thinkerer and either out of your mouth or out of your hands or as all of us as GMs have done out of our ass. Um, the, these great ideas, how do we get them down? How do we gather people to play them? Uh, so Steven, I'm gonna kick it to you first and just say, how did, it, how did designing start? Not necessarily those first things when you were a kid, but the first time you like, I'm really going to rigorously design. Um, I, I think a lot of it was just, uh, you know, as much as I love D and D and the, the various other role playing games I did, uh, th there's always that kind of hubris that where you can go, yeah, I think I can make something better. And of course your early attempts of it, uh, you think are really cool. And then you look back at it and you're like, well, that's a really, really, really dumb idea. Um, <laughs> and you know, and you kind of, uh, at a nickel. Yeah, if, if you, you find the things that you like and the things that you don't like. And then uh, uh, over, over time, uh, I started looking at design a little bit more academically. Like, what are the things that make really, really good design, what, uh, no matter whether or not you're doing adventure writing or whatnot. I started, uh, you know, back, back when I started, there wasn't much literature out on it. But I started doing research and looking into the principles of, uh, of design in general. And just honing my craft, right? Not being afraid to make mistakes, going down rabbit holes that eventually, like, you end up throwing away, but you might learn something from. So it's just persistence. It's it's persistence and kind of never getting sick of uh, of trying something new. And Stephen, correct me if I'm wrong. Did you teach a class or design a class about game design? I've um, I've taught many classes uh, about game design at the uh, uh, Seattle Art Institute, and uh, it always had a very long name, uh, something of the design technology, um, where I taught from basically. Uh, basic game design to the business of game design to user interface um, uh, w within the aspect of game design. And so, and a lot of, uh, a, a good number of my students have gone on to really great things. Um, Crystal Frazier, for instance, was one of my students. Uh, one, one of my students in the first class, uh, I remember her telling me very specifically once that she, she thought I was a better coworker than I was a teacher. And I thought that was cute that she she thought I would care. Um, but, uh, um, uh, and Matt Getz, who worked at Privateer, and a lot of my other students who've gone on to Google and, and, and other sort of things. And it's, it's kind of fun having a whole group of students who, um, you know, send you nice messages and, you know, things like, I just regurgitated everything you told me in that class and I got a job. <laughs> um so okay. the, yeah that's that that's been a really big thrill um and seeing you know that game design courses are out there is 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 a lot of fun to see yeah that's uh, the teaching people is such a wonderful way uh the, the collaborative back and forth if you have a good set of students i i was at, i was in architecture school when i was younger and that back and forth is so critical between the 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 learning something from somebody who's willing to share it with you is pretty cool. Um, so I, I guess then, you know, we talked a little bit about um, like the, I guess we were talking a couple of weeks ago about the importance of design and like the steps of it. So when you make those errors, when you have those failures, I mean, probably they don't come quite as frequently now or are they just as prevalent now as before? Cause you're stretching yourself. Um, yeah, I think they come all the, like, the whole thing about it is, and probably the best way to talk about it is, is Delve, which is a work in progress right now. It's got a, yeah, you know, right on. It's, it's got a Patreon and everything else. And so even with that is I'll come up with a gl like a glimmer of a good idea, but I mean, um, and I've been working on this game on and off for about five years, uh, but I'm constantly making changes, mostly after I see how something I designed is played and what worked and what didn't. Um, 
uh, so uh, I, I mean, the whole idea that it comes pristine off the page, uh, out of your mind onto the page, and you can just give it to players, right? You know, you need the play testing. You need to rethink, um, uh, you know, the, the the various things you put down there, and is it doing exactly what you want it to do, or can it be tweaked a little bit? Um, so even now, uh, if I'm probably most critical of my own work, where I sit there and I'm like, all right, so this is what it is right now, um, uh, but make sure that it's ro you know, it's it's robust enough to be played and and fre or flexible enough to be changed uh, when I find out that. Uh, yeah, that that doesn't work the way I intended it to work. Um, cause, yeah, I yeah. think that's one of the most surprising things that I've found in uh, doing any kind of writing or any kind of mechanics creation is how botched it can get by the player. You know, once the players start rolling the dice, that's always amazing to me. It makes total sense and it looks like it's pretty straightforward. <laughs> and then as soon as it gets to the table, holy crap, they make they come up with some interesting ways to really fuck it up. <laughs> Interpretation. <laughs> yeah. That's certainly true. I mean, even from the standpoint of a GM who runs the rules, doesn't always create them. Uh, that's certainly true. You think something's going to go one way and that's pretty much your warning that you should stop doing that right there. So when you, I imagine, I mean, when I create things, I want to have some level of novelty. I have a dim view of uniqueness because I don't think there's as much uniqueness in the world as people think, but I think making something clever and interesting and, and cool is important. So do you have like an encyclopedic knowledge of what has come before so that you can create something new or do you just create something that feels good and then keep working it until it is what you want? I have a, 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 a pretty massive games library, especially when it comes to role-playing games. Um, and I'm constantly going back and doing what I call rules archaeology. Uh, and I'll give you a, a tangible example of this. So uh, both uh, Pathfinder 2nd Edition and Delve you use what I call my three-act economy, which I uh, first presented in, um, in Pathfinder Unchained. Uh, and that came from me uh, working on 3rd Edition, 3.5, 4th Edition, and then Pathfinder uh, just going, why do actions actually work like this? Why do we have move actions and standard actions and this and this kind of actions? And so, you know, I went back through the history of those games and many other games and figured out the real reason for that was an old war game initiative system. And the balance there was somebody's got to go first. That's always an advantage. How do we balance those things out? You know, the various sort of forms. And, and then I was all like, you know, but in role-playing games, an action is just a unit of time. Why can't actions just be actions be actions? Um, and it, I wouldn't say it was a totally novel idea. A lot of game systems have tried to do that. Um, and there's always background balance stuff that needs to be done. But I decided to fool around with, well, what are those background balance? How, how can I balance that in the background and not let people think about it in the foreground? where they could just go, I want to do this and this and this. And nobody behind the screen was telling them, eh, that's not really the way the rules work. You know, um, being able to say, okay, you can do that, but um, rather than, no, you can't do that. As a game designer, I don't like it when the rules tell me either you can't do that or you can do that, but you really don't want to. Uh, and so I try to, I, I, in my design principles, I'm always trying to, to, to stop those things from happening, especially in role-playing games. Yeah, that's uh, that's that's uh, an interesting insight. I I think that uh, for a lot of GMs, we struggle with the idea of being bound by those rules and the expectations that the players have of the rules and being able to make judgments. So the, the common theme amongst many people that have been on recently and amongst us too is the rule has to be so easily understood that it just, it's like, it's not there. You yep. can just say what you want to do. And if you need to look it up, you can look it up. But otherwise we just go and we dance the dance together, sort of. Yeah, I think games work best when, when, when they have that assumption. When they get to, I think there's an old school sort of uh, idea that the more arcane the rules and the more jargon there's in on it and the more kind of inside knowledge, the more authentic it feels. But I think the, the feature of game design is, is definitely shedding that away and just having ha having you understand when you first read it what i can do with it rather than having to 
you know, go into five different sections and read seven different tables. Do How is this? Go ahead. RPG do What's that? But it. How is the Cinnabar RPG doing these days? Um, I'm not quite. Here's the thing about it: is that dude's my friend on Facebook, and it is <laughs> amazingly interesting to see it, his life um, in, in, in some ways. And I know he had a Kickstarter for it, and for some reason, it didn't get published, or it's having a hard time getting published. And the dude's mad about it, but. Um, I never, other than uh, Logan Bonner, was is really into the weirdness that is Cinnabar. Mm -hmm. um, I've only sort of looked at it and went, "The fuck!" Um, <laughs> uh, it's very inventive. I, I, I will give it that. It's very mm -hmm. all over the uh, all, all over the place. But um, I don't think I could give uh, anything close to. A, a, a rational deconstruction of that game <laughs> so <laughs> that is inside pool everyone for the, <laughs> that is a serious inside pool right there i am i think i only understood about eight of those words so uh it was we'll, all english but, uh, we'll leave yeah. that to we'll leave that to be up to everybody else to look up and understand better um you know i i wanted to say too i think this changing nature that you're talking about in games where um, it's not about looking everything up, which is what traditionally, you know, a lot of gamers were used to. It has to do with this massive expansion of the audience, uh, this audience that, um, you know, embraced 5e like nothing before, uh, that loved that level of uh, straightforwardness. Uh, people who 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 weren't ready to let go of 3.5 and transitioned into Pathfinder, that that whole audience, and then this huge flood of online participation. Um, which frankly, you know, we're obviously part of, but, um, I kind of want to pivot now to Beth and ask a, a question about, uh, about, uh, specifically acquisition of the corporate, you know, they're a trailblazer in this watch live, you know, online RPG thing. And, uh, how do you think they have like that audience have you, how did those people influence gaming? Do you see what, what trends are you seeing occurring in gaming? Uh, that maybe are directly responsible to that online audience? Uh, I'm going to answer two questions, one that wasn't asked. Um, for me as a player now playing with Steven and Julia, I'm a very lazy player. We, we buy a board game and Steven gets handed the rules to read them. I don't give a shit about the rules. I, <laughs> I want someone else to take care of it, right? And I blame that. And, and I'm a researcher. I was an anthropology major. So I, I like to read and I like to write. But... I think because of social media, I think we're retraining our brains for shorter bits of information and lack of patience, honestly. Um, so I think that gamers that are coming into this game now want to be able to do things faster and not have to take the time to invest in these giant books that we're creating. And that's actually some of the feedback we've gotten about our acquisitions incorporated book is people are able to pick it up and kind of just play without, I got one too. Nice, nice product placement. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Without yeah. having to invest as much time or, or money. <clears throat> but, but our game for sure, it was, it started out as the podcast and before the podcast, a little bit of trivia, uh, Steven actually ran the first game of D and D for my owners. He ran a game at a PAX for Will Wheaton, uh, Mike, Jerry, Fay, and somebody else. I think it was Scott. Was Scott? Might have been Scott. Yeah. Was, in yeah. 2008. Yeah. So I was very excited to find a picture of it on the internet, and I need to to print that because it's very cool. So That's in awesome. my interview, yeah. I mentioned that, and I also mentioned that Steven worked on 4E just in case they didn't want to hire me because I hated 4E and they freaked out because they all love 4E so much. And that's what they started AI playing. So AI started to, um, as an advertisement for WotC, as well as to get Mike into playing D and D and it worked oh. on both counts. <laughs> that is an excellent <laughs> origin story. Uh, I, I think that, uh, you know, what you said about people, the short attention span, I think that's one part of it. But also, like, how do we address this now? I mean, 
I still go to conventions and I see books. I see big fat books and I see uh, lots of luscious art and I want all those people to keep writing those big books and right. doing all that art. But is the future of it a hybrid? Do we start including, does Steven perhaps start recording little audio files to go with his Delve stuff? So when you want the sound of the bugbear snarling, you get his bugbear snarl, you know, like, <laughs> I, I just wonder where it goes. I mean, I think there's going to be multiple audiences. So, so watching Steven work on Delve, he is absolutely simplifying the game. He can have players sit down at the table that have never played before and, and play a game of Delve and be incredibly satisfied with it and feel like they got a robust game. So, and, and so one of the things that I do is I'm on the, the board for Monocle Society, which creates a game called Leave. And they're mm -hmm. working on augmented reality RPGs and, and yeah. they're going, yeah. So they actually have a, a, a big announcement they're going to make at West and next Wednesday, they're going to announce what they're going to announce at West. At right. Tax he, tried, he tried to explain to me what it was, but I didn't, I didn't understand it all that well. Didn't, didn't process it. Yeah. I, yeah. I think this, this hybrid approach, my guess is that the industry, and I don't have research, I'm just going by my gut, the industry has figured out that we've hooked a lot of people with the idea, with the fun, but the thing that surrounds the idea and the fun still is a barrier for a lot of people. And yeah. if you can, and you, you can have both. It's not like you have to have one or the other. Right. But I've been a big proponent of having things to sell to players. It's been such a GM-centric world. Uh, you know, this is like all the books for the thousands of dollars, right? No, none of my players invests that. And I, and I'd love to see everybody be able to take a bite out of that, you know, have things yeah. to have apps and so forth. So, yeah, even when our daughter goes to show, she doesn't want to buy the books. She wants dice and she wants minis, right? Yes. She wants painting materials and stuff that she can interact with, but not just sit around with. Hero think... Forge is huge at my, I have, I have oh, a, yeah. two, every two weeks I have five young women who play in my game, my daughter and her friends, and they're just all about Hero Forge. Every time they make a new character, they're like, and now we have a printer so they can just get the file oh, and have Papa print it for them, you know, but uh, <laughs> it's, it's amazing. And, and I think these, already my daughter wants to run and she goes, well, I'm going to pre-record stuff. Like, I'll be too nervous to say it, so I'm just going to record it, and then I can play it during the thing. I'm like, hey, man, do what you got to do, yeah. uh, however you can ease yourself into it. Put it on Alexa. Um, Put it on right? Alexa. Yeah, you can. You can roll dice with Alexa. <laughs> so, yeah, I think uh, to, to best point, yeah, the, the audience definitely seems to be wanting easier and easier rules. Uh, it feels mm -hmm. like kind of a teeter-totter effect, though. The, the, the lighter the rules are, the more uh, involved, the more uh, seasoned maybe that the game master has to be. The game master has to take that load at some point, right? So he's going to be running a lot of that game. For the light, the lighter the rules are, the game master is going to have to pick up a lot of that. I feel like so the have, you know the more that the players want to invest in the rules, maybe they uh, can offset some of that. But yeah, I mean, I absolutely agree. I, I think that that's the way rules are growing, and if anything, fifth edition shows us that. Well, I, 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 I add on a little bit to that. I think um, their fifth edition has been extremely po uh, popular, and it's a very good game. What is that? Someone's dog. <laughs> oh, um, and uh, but uh, something we found in the development of P two, and now the launch of P two. Um, uh, one of one of the shortcomings of fifth edition is it doesn't have a lot of modularity for character creation uh once you create a character in the beginning and i've noticed this i play in a 5e game and i've been playing in it for two and a half almost three years we're up to 13th level i play my cleric the same way i played my cleric at first level um uh i've got more spells um i hit things harder uh but uh, we're, we're finding that People do want certain types of complexity as long as it's done in an easy way, and they're they're a little <laughs> thirsty for it. Uh oh, Matt, you went. That was not at all yeah. to imply that the fifth edition was the end all be all of of simplicity. Only that I think I can see where Beth is coming from with uh, hey, people want to be able to just walk in and sit down and play a game. But yeah, yeah. You're absolutely. I mean, fifth edition's not. 
when it's when you say it's not complex, it is. Uh, there's yeah, there's very little modularity, like to your point. But Stephen just found out today one of our friends is going to play the the Ack Inc game with Pathfinder Two. Uh -huh. It's real oh, nice. Like, yeah. See, I think one thing we touched on previously in uh, another episode is that uh, many of us gamers are getting older. We have less and less time. And so... Um, but to live? Less, <laughs> that also... <laughs> you know, guys, I didn't want to bring it up, but... You know, uh, Speak for yourself, Brian. I'm living forever. <laughs> that's great. He's got his lichdom for laundry already. Yeah, lichdom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What I was getting at is a, a nice, easy system allows you to tell a story and have less prep work, whereas more options for the player characters is great because that gives you continued play, right? You have more and more options. And I, I really think P2 kind of hit that one on the head. So a little bit easier game system to play than Pathfinder 1. Tons and tons of options. Uh, that's win-win in my book. That is definitely what we were aiming for. So, yay us. Yay. Or, or now them. So. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. So, but but you guys actually like I have experience playing with with kids. I mean, like what do they notice that difference? Do they notice that I mean, do they appreciate that when you're playing the home game just the th you know, just the three of you? Yeah, I think so. I mean, um, when Julia sat down and made her character, she definitely wanted, you know, uh, just like any kind of kid, she she wanted a lot of options, right? Uh, she wanted to be a druid, and she wanted to be this kind of druid, and she wanted to have this thing, and this thing, and this thing. And so even when she was making her character, she was very into, like, what choices would make it her character rather than just a generic character um, and she loves that character so much that uh, last Halloween she went as that character um, and <laughs> oh, even that's after awesome yeah and even after the playtest was over and uh, we got the full book she's basically sat down and recreated that character you know that 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 that, that character is her character I am sure that eventually uh, she will sit there and and tire of that character want to make you know something else based on you know, the things that she played with her friends or whatever anime she watched or just whatever fight of, of flight of fancy. And I'm glad that the uh, uh, P2 is robust enough where um, she's going to be able to do that. And of course, uh, as I work on Dell, one of my goals is when she plays that game that she will be able to play the kind of, you know, just whatever crazy character uh, she's going to want to play uh, when when that game starts rolling. It, it's fun to watch her challenge Steven and the choices that Paizo made in that book that she does not agree with. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. She is not afraid of speaking up and going, oh. why, why this? That's oh, dumb. Like, oh, great. That's yeah. Great. yeah, that's what I get. I'm like, but it's in the rules. And they're like, but the rules are stupid. Okay. Well, I, I can't argue with you there. That's yeah, your, that's I, your future consumer, though. That right? That's the that's the voice you need to be listening to. Yeah. That, sure, is, that is indeed. In uh, so in 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 my experience, uh, my the girls that play in my game, uh, they want to make background. They want to write stories. They want to create this entire, and they all have to have relationships with each other, even if they're bad relationships. Uh, and they do. They develop you know, they design bad relationships with each other. Um, and then for them, the rules are often kind of an afterthought. Like that's just how to execute these relationships, how to like actually make them happen and maybe fight some stuff and go through some traps. Um, so for me, it's a little challenging to like keep them on the rails with any sort of structure because they just kind of want to create the story themselves. And I don't have a lot to do. Uh, every once in a while, I just make something weird happen. So they have to react to it. But other than that, there's not a whole lot of, they kind of provide their own game. Yeah, so Steven can't hear this part. Um, in the game that we're currently playing, so her character before was a much kinder character. Her character now is kind of an asshat. And I'm, I keep waiting for the, the NPCs that we're playing with just to turn on her and be like, what the fuck is your problem, elf? <laughs> yep. <sighs> yep. 
I, I have a character who consistently the, the falls into that role in, in our game where she's just like, I don't care what anybody thinks about what I'm going to do. I'm going to do what I want. Yeah. And, and that's me adventuring. Okay. And everybody else is like, but we can't hang together. She's like, fine. I'll go off on my own. <laughs> you know, and, and so I'm like, no, no, please don't. Please don't do this. I can't have five different games going on at the same time. Well, role playing so, games I, are so great for kids because they can explore those yeah. kind of antisocial aspects of their personality oh without yeah. inflicting it yeah. on on friends. Hopefully, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Don't I, I, work in the game. Right. <laughs> yeah, um, it, you guys on something else though that uh, there is a changing demographic to uh, gamers gamers in general. Uh, I think that. Once upon a time in the old 70s and 80s, it was very much a male centric hobby. Um, and today, if you go to gaming conventions, you see so many more girls and women, mm -hmm. frankly, playing role playing games, uh, either perfectly mixed with other, you know, male groups or they have their own female only gaming groups, which I love. So it, it's not an old boys club anymore. And what do you guys think about? With women being so much of a force in the gaming industry today, will that have an influence on what products we see in the future? Hopefully. I mean, in a lot of ways, I think it already has. And it was a lesson that I learned, you know, being an 11-year-old in the 80s, um, and it just didn't seem to be something that girls were into. Uh, girls my age were into and I would talk about it all the time because I was a huge geek and, and everything else and sometimes you get like one or two that were kind of interesting or w would read the Dragonlance novels because uh, that was non-threatening and I think something we didn't realize growing up is is the um, uh, the sexual segregation back in the 80s which was much greater mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's just the thing in that we in general or in gaming uh, I think in, in general, general. yeah. yeah, yeah for sure. Girls did for sure. this and boys did this mm -hmm. and they don't meet for whatever, you know, yeah. crazy societal reasons. Sure. But yeah. once I turned 18 and got out on my own and everything else, I found out uh, that there were a lot of women who actually wanted to play these games um, because they were fun. They just didn't want to go to games and, and deal with boys hitting on them or mm -hmm. being stupid. And so it's all like... So if you were you were inviting and you weren't an asshat, women would play and they'd have a great yeah. time um, yeah. because, you know, role playing games are for everyone. Uh, and so that's that struck me a lot. It, you know, when I it, growing up and everything else, I tended to have more women play in my games, I think, just because it was a, it, it was a more it's inviting a experience. Boy, apparently, according well, to yeah. That. And because I was a hot boy. Um, well, although. <laughs> <laughs> and and a lot of them were like you know my friends girlfriends and and I, I had or or just women who wanted to play which were looking for a, a, a good stable group um, uh, two of my friends who got married actually uh, met at my game um, which was which was really nice uh, and they're they're still a great couple did you have a role playing what a D and D wedding? For I've them had that well? experience. Too. <laughs> no, they they <laughs> actually they got they got married well. I, I, well, not I wouldn't say well after the game was over, but you know they were college friends, and uh, mm -hmm. they ended up uh, you know building a relationship and getting married after that. So, um, so I think a, you know we live in a different time, quite frankly, a better time, uh, but. Uh, we have to be, I, I think, cognizant that we have to invite everybody to sit around the game table and enjoy these games. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we had women at our table because we invited them to come play. Mm -hmm. like, and, we, and, we, and we kept mentioning it because we saw they were reading Robert Jordan right. and, or they were reading, you know, Steve or Donaldson or something. They were like, hey, you know, you, the, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, all you have to do is like turn 90 degrees and there's a whole other thing you can do. And so, uh, so don't, you have don't a dragon on Donaldson. Um, so, Stephen, I mean, we're loosely talking about freelance game design today. Um, I, I know that there's people who are watching that are probably curious about how did they become a freelancer? How, how did they get into this crazy hobby, right? Um, you, of all people, probably have some great experience and knowledge of how to begin. How would a, how would a brand new person who, who's got crazy ideas and wants to put them down on paper, how do they jump into this? 
Uh, well, I think there's there's two aspects of that. I've got crazy ideas. I want to put them down on paper. Um, well, luckily we have the internet. Uh, train yourself uh, uh, on publishing and just give it a shot. Um, and take criticism. Uh, for those of you who want to um, have a somewhat steady income and will actually want to work for various publishers, um, get to know what those pu their publishing standards are. Uh, uh, get to know the people who assign work. Um, uh, let them know you're interested. Uh, those publishers eventually need people to write their stuff and they will give you work, at least on a tryout basis, to see how well you do. And after that, it's do that work, do it as, as well as you can, be willing to take criticism and feedback, uh, be willing to realize that sometimes the publisher is so busy with so many projects that you won't get that feedback in a very personal form, but read what the finished product is re, uh, and try to analyze what kind of changes were made and maybe why, um, and keep on improving your craft. Uh, and don't get discouraged. Um, uh, and also, I would say, uh, don't sell yourself short. Um, uh, Role-playing games, no matter what a lot of sort of companies and publishers will let you know, is a business. Um, uh, try to find fair rates whenever possible. Uh, unless it's something like Wayfinder, which is a, a fan magazine, right, that doesn't make a profit on it, uh, don't accept no money, don't work for free. Um, and, and once you've honed your craft and everything else, make sure that you're paid the rate that, you, that is worth you getting out of bed in the morning um, and, and, and starting typing. Um, don't quit yeah. your day job at first. Don't quit your day job at first. Maybe later on you can do it. Um, but, uh, uh, but yeah, just keep on working at it. See what's out there. See what people like, um, uh, capitalize on what's good, um, uh, destroy with ruthlessness, what, what you produce that's bad. Um, uh, don't put up your own roadblocks in front of you. I've had plenty of people who, 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 who have done that. Uh, well, I, I, I can't do it. Um, and in what it, sense? Yeah. Mental? Yeah, yeah mental. Yeah. There, there self are plenty. Of, yeah. There's going to be plenty of people on the internet telling you you suck even when you don't. Um, yep. Don't tell it to yourself. Yep. Uh, yep. Uh, but, you know, it, it, be fair and realistic uh, with yourself as well. I, I, I guess, I mean, it all sounds kind of like a self-help book, but, yeah, that's kind of what I would tell yep. you. That could be your next business. I love the idea. You writing a self help <laughs> Great. Yeah, it dovetails well with your teaching. I think you should, yeah, definitely get a book out. You can the call industry. it Flight of Fantasy Games. The industry is very small, too, and everyone talks to everybody else, so meet your deadlines. Yep. Oh, God, yes. Be an organized artist. You don't even have to be organized. You just have to look like you are. They exist. Yeah, yep. fair enough, fair enough. Yeah, and for our younger audience members, when we talk about working for free, what we mean is, can you buy a cheeseburger with it? If the answer is no, you're working for free. <laughs> so <laughs> people who tell you about publicity or likes or social mentions or whatever that is, yeah. tell them to give you all that and buy you a cheeseburger. Collectively exposure. Yeah, yeah exposure. It, you, you die of exposure on the Oregon Trail. That's, That's the right. party, right? <laughs> right. I guess yeah. that technically. Or, or, or dysentery, whichever one. Right. But yeah, uh, I, I would say that is that is what I would tell you. Um, oh, and, and 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 here's a good one too: is if for whatever reason, and this will happen, you were behind your deadlines, be honest about it, yes. and and be honest about why you do it. Um, uh, you'll find that um, I know as somebody who uh, used to wrangle freelancers uh, for the various Pathfinder hardback books, um, I know I always put in cushion time. Uh, a lot of times books have cushion time because you know that real life will get in the way. You know, you'll have a pet die or you'll get dysentery or whatever. <laughs> and, um, uh, and I, I've had people who have produced really great work for me that are all like, oh, I just need three more days. Um, and luckily, I put in enough slack in the schedule where I'm like, okay, you got, I'll, I'll typically say you got five. Get it done. 
Um, and uh, yeah. So uh, on the other end of freelancing, if you ever find yourself wrangling freelancers, put in some wiggle room because real life gets in the way. Mm -hmm. It goes for all creatives. It goes for yeah. all creatives. Inspiration can be tough. It can. Sometimes it dries up at the, at the most inopportune of times. I find marijuana helps. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yes. I think yeah. that is categorically true. Stephen often says he can't afford to have a uh, writer's block because that's how he makes a living. So he is constantly working. Even if he's not typing, oh, there's stuff going saying. on in his head and he's talking things out and he's reading books. And... Right, right. Yeah. I don't yeah. think that's where that was going, but yeah, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> he's yeah. constantly. I, um, I so when Stephen smokes marijuana, he cleans the house. So I That's highly true. encourage that. <laughs> Sometimes I put it in his food. I was just going to say, you bring it home for him. <laughs> I'm growing it right now. <laughs> she is not. But that would be oh, awesome. Yeah. Y'all can chat with me later. I'm in the business. So. <laughs> what? Where is this <laughs> I got it. Wow, we've, we've yeah. real hardly. Some people, some people would say this conversation is devolving, but I think it's evil. Yeah, right. So I, I don't imbibe of the pot, so Stephen knows all of his stash is very safe. And when I had my accounting firm, I had a farming, uh, a, a weed farming client, and they had these gorgeous plants in this gorgeous warehouse, and they were so upset that I didn't understand how wonderful they were. Yeah, you're just like, yeah, they're all lost they're on me. They're really yeah. green. That's, that's I want to see the cash. I don't care about the weed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow. That is All right. awesome. So, uh, You're welcome. So that, yes. I got a question for you. All right. So you were lucky enough to play games with your kids, right? Your child loves playing role-playing games with you guys, board games. What could you say to other parents who really want to get their kids into it? However, their kids are distracted by video games and don't have the appreciation for role-playing games? Uh, two things. I think my parenting technique is a lot different than a lot of parents, and it's one reason why Steven and I get along so well, <laughs> is I find what my kids are interested in, and I get interested in that thing. So I, when Steven and I first started dating, he didn't want to date a gamer, and he didn't want to date someone in the industry. I'm in the industry, and now I come home, and I'm like, I want to fucking kill somebody, so run me a game, boy. No, I don't, say it like that. I don't, I don't um, think she used that word. But, I'm, I, but I only started playing the game because Julia <laughs> wanted to play the game, and, and she couldn't just play with Steven. She needed another person to play. Um, when Julia often asks Steven to run games, or she'll ask me if Steven is ready. Um, but when she doesn't, if I notice she is on her tablet too much or we're not having family time, I just ask Stephen to arrange something for us so we can sit at the table for a little bit and play. And he, he, doesn't, he doesn't make four-hour sessions for us. Right. Mm -hmm. We get to a certain point and he's like, okay, the night's over. And sometimes that's at half an hour, sometimes that's an hour. And sometimes it's honestly just Stephen and Julia sitting with the book talking about things she can do with her character. So I think for Julia, it's, it's, honestly, it's honestly more about just spending time with us mm -hmm. than it is about playing the game. Um, yeah. A very good perspective. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah, I think from inside, we see it as this all-encompassing thing, right? But uh, for some people, it's just a, it's a snack. It doesn't have to be yeah. their lifelong pursuit. You know. Well, the funny thing about her, though, is she identifies as a gamer, and even her friends have said, you know, in your future, you're going to be this big D&D &D person, and the majority of her clothing is gaming now. She's in love with uh, Schwalb's clothing line. She's a Shadow of the Demon Lord fan and has never cracked a book, right? Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's wild. That is wild. That is a cool, yeah, I've never, I, I never stopped to consider, I think Death Saves kind of kicked some of that stuff up a notch as well because they just made it purely about it's just clothes uh but the idea that fa that D, D is fashion now yeah. mm -hmm. well penny arcade we we've produced so many t-shirts that i actually asked them to put them in those square plastic things and put them on the wall like a quilt and lydia said we can't we've made too many that's crazy <laughs> that'd be We're nice just... to look at some of them hmm. yeah i think 
Hmm. Huh. Crazy. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. I owe you a shirt. <laughs> subtle. I'm subtle. <laughs> Yeah. So there, well, there's a couple PAX events coming. You can come by. So we also make all of the merchandise for all the PAX stuff. That's right. You just PAX throw that South. right back at him. When was the last time you were at a PAX there, Jimmy? PAX South, baby. Mm. Where's it at? <laughs> wow. PAX South. Are they still having it? Yeah. Google, Google. Are you going to be there in January? Well, I'm thinking about it because apparently we've got to start splitting up all these cons we're going to be going to. Jimmy Jimmy has been talked into a lot of conventions in the last year. <laughs> and now we've got and now we've got our guests doing it. This is even better. I'm hoping oh. to be at South. Last year I had tickets and I got incredibly ill the morning of. No, no. And so I did not go because PAX Con credit is a thing that I don't want to spread. I brought GinCon. I'd like to go to Unplugged. You, you'll be at Unplugged? Yeah, I'd like to. Steven That's and I will be at Unplugged. Yeah. Yep. So maybe I can talk uh, Tara into letting us do that as a family vacation. That'd be fun. That'd yeah, be you so could fun. see all the stuff in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. That'd be really fun. And our friends, even Beth. <laughs> that would be cool. That would be very right. fun. Yeah, it's it, uh, unplugged is doubled in size again, so we had to change the. Oh my gosh. The footprint, yeah, it's very mm -hmm. exciting. How big is it now? Super big. Good answer. Super big. <laughs> super big. <laughs> not so just big. Exact not just numbers. big. Super big. Yeah. Well, uh, so this this is kind of going all over the place, but I got to be perfectly honest. I just want to hear right now about what's going on with Delve. Uh, that's kind of what I've been waiting for this whole time. So I don't know what you can share with us, Stephen, but like obviously since leaving Paizo, Pathfinder was a huge part of your life yeah uh, both the first years, and second editions really. yeah and so nine? you, you right. finish something like that or you come to the close of that chapter like what gets you excited and how does that excitement flow into this new this new thing this this delve rpg like i said i um i i think i ran the first play test of uh early delve probably about four years ago um in uh some friends of mine in Northern uh, California where I had, um, and I would started working on it two years, two, a year and a half, two years before that. Um, I just had a general idea of, I sort of wanted to build a better mousetrap. I had some ideas on, on, uh, you know, how character creation, what the action economy, what the background math would be. Um, uh, things like uh, my version of non spell spellcasting and stuff like that. And, and then when I produced the f first very rough draft, people really dug it. They were like, wow, this does some really interesting things. Um, so over the last three years, every time I go to a convention, I've got a, a set of Iconics and I run an adventure. Um, I've done it at Cobalt Con, uh, uh, at Gary Con, um, even at Paizo Con and stuff like that. And the feedback has been overwhelmingly positive. So right now I'm working on a thing which I call the Proto, um, which is a uh, e either it's going to be levels one to five or one to ten, um, with four now expanded to five main classes, uh, four four races, um, and that's going to be released as a PDF. I just ordered some of the first art for that book. Um, yeah, it's not. And it's it's going to be uh, yeah. I, I got uh, Rick Hershey um, doing art for it, uh, which I, I had. Good choice. Yeah, yeah. He, he I, because 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 I'm me. I want this old black and white, old school style uh, uh, to present it at least at first. Um, and so, uh, so I'm I I started a Patreon uh, uh, a little over a month ago. Um, to get people uh, excited about it, uh, they can get and some what's insider. What's the URL of that Patreon? Yes, oh, it's in chat, dude. Way ahead yeah, of it's, it's, it's it's down there the um, or over <laughs> there or whatever. Patreon.com uh, backslash Delve RPG. Yeah, and. Uh, I've got a couple of, you know, it's uh, early stuff. I've got a Discord channel where folks can ask me questions or talk to me or I'll ask them questions. Uh, I've got a, a blog um, that I've been uh, running uh, for the last three, 
three or four years over at uh, www.delve-rpg.com. I know that one. Um, <laughs> Uh, where I talk about my ideas about the game uh, and even talk about how they developed and where they came from. Uh, I, I have my historical asides where I go back and I tell, I talk about my influences on certain decisions. Um, it's a D20 game, uh, uses three action economy. Uh, it is, as, as I describe it, it will seem strangely familiar or familiarly strange. Um, <laughs> uh, like the ability scores, there are six of them, but they're named differently just because I wanted to get away from uh, some of the the mentality of I know what this ability score is. I wanted to sort of reframe them. Um, Spellcasters. So do, they, do they change? Are they the six the same six with different names? Or are they different? They do different stuff. They do a little bit of different stuff. Um, cool. So uh, they're roughly the same. Like if you, if it really bugged you, you could say, okay, that's strength, that's dexterity, and that's constitution. Sure, but, sure. Um, like uh, the 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 charisma analog is charm, and that does a lot more. It it uh, it's got a heroic sto score that's attached to it. Um, uh, awareness, which I just like as a uh, is a better term to wisdom. Um, is basically how in tune you are to not only your environment, but sometimes your own inner mental states, um, uh, knowledge, sure. and, and stuff like that. Um, uh, one of my chief goals for Delve is don't have numbers mean other numbers, um, which everybody goes, <laughs> what is that? And I'm like, well, you've got a score of 18, which means you have a plus four. Or... Uh, yeah. Or you have experience points, which means you're of a certain level. Uh, uh, and basically, I love cutting cruft at a, in, in sometimes sacred cows as I go uh, to make what I think is a better, faster play experience. Um, uh, secular initiative is gone. Uh, the initiative system is, is something more akin to what you see in Shadow of the Demon Lord, which I think is a vastly superior initiative system where uh, you get three actions, but if you want to go before the bad guys, you'll, you, you've got to spend an action in order to, to do that. So you've got less things you can do, but you're going faster. Um, some bad guys can ha have the same thing, though, so they can kind of sneak up on you. Um, so it, so it's, all, it's all a meditation on, uh, on D20 gaming and uh, instead of sticking to things that have been around forever, I, I question those things and I try to move forward. That is that I appreciate uh, innovation that still holds a little bit of the traditional. So there's a foothold for people, but then they got to they got to climb up something new and something uh, a little more challenging to their preconceptions. Yeah, well, there was a good question in chat there for you, Stephen, about the uh, sculptor was asking about why no Kickstarter. Um, so I started with the Patreon first, uh, and the Patreon is mostly there uh, to see what kind of critical mass I can go as I, as, as I put out the proto. And, and the proto really is kind of a glorified, well, more than glorified uh, playtest uh, play document. And it's going to be a series of five PDFs. Um, mm -hmm. uh, four of those PDFs, well, five or six PDFs, based on whether or not I flesh out the Hunter, which is a request on Patreon. My my biggest donor, I told him he could uh, pick whatever class out of uh, the first four, and he picked the Hunter class. Um, and I said, okay. And so I've started designing that class. Uh, so if so you just want to... What's fighter, that? Wizard, is that fighter, wizard, thief, uh, cleric? Warrior, or, wizard, maybe? priest... Uh, uh, warrior, wizard, priest, and uh, rogue. Okay, plus hunter. And Got it. Plus hunter, and um, uh, and so so the idea there is uh, four four or five of those PDFs will just be they're very player centric. Um, I want to play a rogue, and and quite frankly, the rogue one will be free. The rogue's free. You can just download it and see what it is. And it comes with, how do I make a rogue? How does the game work? And if you really don't want to make a character, you get one of the iconics as well. And throughout that document, I talk about 
how I built the iconic and why I made certain decisions. So it gives you kind of an idea of how it goes goes along. Um, I want to play a wizard. You download that one. I want to. Be, I want everything, or I want to be the GM. Uh, there'll be a main document, uh, and it's it, it'll have things in it. Uh, not only how you play the game and make a character, but here's how you run the game, and here's some monsters, and here's a sample adventure uh, to get you kind of started on uh, uh, a quirky little. Uh, Jack Vance, as in the writer, sort of tale called uh, The Crystal Mans. Um, and so, yeah, so right now it's, it's if you want inside baseball, if you want to see stuff early, if you want your opinion shared early on what you see uh, in a way that it will definitely grab my attention, that's what the Patreon is, is for. It's a, it's a way for people who have either played in or, or read about the project uh, to support gives me an idea of how many hours a week I absolutely have to work on this thing and not work on freelance projects. Um, just so uh, uh, folks feel like they're getting their money's worth and we're progressing at a good clip. Um, and then if the play test goes as well as I hope it'll go, uh, then eventually we'll look at actual book publishing and uh, a Kickstarter for it. That'd be awesome. King, I love, uh, this, King, I love this approach where you are thinking about doing a prototype. I mean, literally, like this is the beginning and you're bringing in a s smaller cadre of people and really just trying to assess. It's a lot like how people actually GM. There used to be this, this mantra of you read all the books, you know all the things, that's what makes a good GM. And now everybody's coming out of the woodwork admitting finally, no, you only do as much as you need to do to move it to the next spot right. and you don't waste your time on stuff that is ultimately going to be fruitless. I think, I think this approach is, is killer uh, because it challenges that publishing preconception as well. Yeah. I mean, I'm also a big advocate that uh, most gamers out there don't understand the publishing process. And there's part of me I'd like to educate that uh, folks as well. Um, I've talked to many folks who have run Kickstarters who have relayed to me after the fact that they ended up putting like two or $3,000 of their own money into the Kickstarter just to see the work get out. Well, I'm sorry, this is, this is a profession, it's an art form, and it's a business. Um, and so uh, there's a part of me that goes, well, maybe you should never have done that Kickstarter. Uh, right. uh, and, and part of the problem is with Kickstarter, a lot of people are very unrealistic. They want everything for cheap and no, they're like actually appetizer. underselling um, what is possible uh, for a sustainable tabletop RPG industry from, sure. you know, because yeah, we can have Watsi and Paizo and they can dominate the industries, but I actually think innovation and, and, uh, finding good creators uh, is more helpful to the industry in the long yes. run. Well, I think if you look at indie games, indie games have been ahead of the curve for a, a good amount of time, changing like some of the mechanics that we're seeing as mainstream today have been in indie games, um, more story driven, lighter games. Uh, so you're absolutely right. A guy that I kind of followed for a long time was Monty Cook because I liked the fact that he stepped Ooh. out onto that branch, Heard that but he didn't let go of the tree. You know, he didn't create mm -hmm. a completely indie game. He just made a lot of mechanical changes and interesting choices. Yep. You know, big box. I got my big box. My cube is right there. <laughs> hey, King, King Bashman in Twitch, uh, in Twitch chat was wanting to know if you're going to be running Delve at PAX Unplugged when you're out there, Stephen. I haven't made plans for that yet, but I'd be happy to do it. Well, there you go. All right, great. It's fun. I played it. It's it was a good time. I'm glad you liked it, Brian. Yo, man. <laughs> no, the feedback has been absolutely excellent. There's, uh, you know, I've I ran it at Winter Fantasy with all of the five E players uh, this year. A lot of people were like, "Yeah, I'm going to think about that for a while." Uh, folks love how fast it is. Um, uh, they like that the mechanics have a bit of humor in them and are uh, relatively straightforward. Uh, well, very straightforward. Um, I've got I, I, I've got a few mechanics I need to you know start beating into submission, but um, uh, I've gotten 
really good feedback from every group that I've played, uh, including critical feedback that made me go back and rethink a couple of things. Um, uh, yeah, play testing is, and, and face to face pay, play testing is really, really, really good. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, even when we were doing P2, I ended up going to this event that I forget what it was called, but it was like speed gaming. And so I had to teach a whole bunch of people, some of whom who had never played role playing games before P2 in 20 minutes and then run a game. Oh, my. That's really um, and I did it. Hmm. I, I think I did it about eight, maybe 10 times uh, over the course <laughs> of, uh, of a couple of days. Um, and uh, it taught me a lot about where the playtest system was really working and where it wasn't. And I was able to come back with a lot of really good uh, anecdotal rather than, you know, sort of the statistical information that we gathered from that playtest. And it taught me a lot about, uh, about things that I want to do with Delve as well. The Iron Designer Challenge. The Iron Designer Challenge, definitely. Mm -hmm. You know, some of these people had never like. They're like, "What is? What are these dice?" Uh, I work in a library. Um, I'm, you know, I don't, I, I don't know what to do with six these. sides, <laughs> right? Um, and it was very. By the time I was done, the people walked away. It was like, "Wow, I didn't even know these kind of games were a thing. This is really fun." Uh, you know, that, that, that made my heart swell. Yeah, it is. It, Oh, it's man. a very good feeling. Yeah. You had a player at Colbacon that had never played an RPG. You had to loan him dice and teach mm -hmm. him all that. Oh, I didn't know that. That's, is yeah. that right? That's yeah. awesome. He signed up for a bunch of stuff. He thought it was a board game convention. Right. And then he came in and he's like, okay, I'm going to play all the things. So he signed up for, I think, three games. Yeah. That's cool. Love story. That's real cool. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. I, um, there was a convention that I was in in uh, Arkansas, and this, uh, this kid was so enamored with what was going on, and uh, he was my co-GM for a little while. I get, let him play the monsters for Delve, and he just thought that was the coolest thing ever. Okay, so I have a question for you guys. Well, I, and Stephen, I don't want you to say a word un until we give Beth a chance to reveal the truth. Okay. Okay. Um, so, I don't think anybody who's been talking for a long time, you know that he has this fun debate <laughs> about dice or attribute rolling versus point by. So, Beth, <laughs> when you use your characters, does he force you to use the point by system or does he allow you guys to roll up your own characters? I don't want to roll up my own character. That's what we did in junior high. And I like the way we're doing it now better. That shit's dumb. No. Oh, shit. Yeah, it's just... an actor. It's to understand. Hey, it's not sporadic. I can make actual choices. <laughs> yes. Yes. Meaningful choices should not be put to dice rolls. Yeah. So that that's one thing that, that Steven doesn't like. He doesn't like games that play him. He likes games that are strategy-based. And I'm... Ooh, that's I like some games that play me, but when it comes to RPGs, I, I want to be as in control as possible. I'll go on long tangents about I can enjoy a game of Settlers <laughs> of Catan, but that's a game that plays me. I'm just waiting for it to tell me what I can do. Yeah. Um, and sure. I'd much rather play Ticket to Ride, which is a game that I make meaningful choices every single time, or Carcassonne, or something like yeah. that. Right. So I love the new Pathfinder um Pathfinder 2 system of generating stats. I think it's really cool. However, I personally disagree with you, and I think that's okay. I mean, obviously, we're allowed to have different opinions. Yeah. Yeah. And, no, and, no, you're not. No, you're not. Get out. Yeah. You can be wrong, <laughs> Brian. That's I'm fine. Yeah. <laughs> it, the way I, from, from my perspective, I don't want to go to a, um, a game table and have three guys that are exactly the same stats because they're playing very similar roles. Um, I like Why? that possibility. I'm sorry? Why? Why does that matter to you? Because I think when you're dice rolling, it creates Unless unique opportunities hit. for role playing. And if your fighter magically, you know, just randomly happened to have a high intelligence, well, maybe you're more of a tactician. Um, you know, maybe if your rogue happens to have high wisdom, well, you know, that's, that's part of the, the story that you get to breathe into your character. Um, whereas if you happen to be building your, your point by characters, most people I feel are going to kind of abuse that system and kind of min max their characters be like everyone else. 
So I like the uniqueness and um, the randomness myself. I I don't think stats should uh, dictate role playing. Mm-hmm. I, I don't dic- di- dictate. Certainly, I agree with you, Stephen. They it shouldn't dictate. Like but as a guy who runs Call of Cthulhu, trust me, like the stats just don't matter. Uh, <laughs> you, you're gonna, <laughs> you're gonna. It doesn't. It just doesn't. It, they don't come into it that much. And for, for as far as I'm concerned, I just want people to have just a check they can make when they need to, because most of it can just be played out. You know, my my. Yeah. I don't allow a lot of checks. People say, "Can I try for this?" I'm like, "No." No, you can just describe what you want to do. This doesn't require some uh, some role. And I think the difference between people's stats um, kind of averages out over the whole group, right? So even if they're all identical, then they're really average. But who cares? It's still about how you apply that plus three or so, the situation you choose to. People also have uh, some interesting misconceptions uh, and and – confirmation biases brian, when they talk brian about like misconception brian has a misconception yeah, brian right. has total brian. fucking misconceptions and confirmation <laughs> bias um See, it's not so, just us brian it's not just us no, no. and uh, <laughs> what, what one of my favorite kind of stories about point by versus role playing is, or point by versus uh rolling up your character scores is I was playing in uh, in a Paizo game that Jason Bullman was running, and this is when I was working at Watsi. I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> and, uh, um, We're going to do that a lot. Jason had us roll up our scores. And, of course, I rolled my eyes. I'm like, okay, great. Mm-hmm. And I rolled incredible scores. I got like an 18, mm-hmm. a seven, two 17s, like, and he actually nerfed my scores. He was like, yeah, those are too high. You can't kind of do that. And so I think a lot of people, they like the idea of you roll up scores and you have to deal with the shit that you're given, but nobody wants, and nobody especially wants me to have the super Mm -hmm. uber character because they know I'm just going to, you know, go, go crazy on that. So I think in a lot of ways, right, what seems like a homogenous take on character the design actually just ensures that everybody can participate in the roles that they want to play at the same level. The choices you make with class and race and the various choices that you make within those categories create the diversity that's necessary for individual characteristics and good role playing. So do you even need stats? Yeah. I mean, it, it, it depends on the game, right? Like there are plenty of games that really, uh, mostly more story-driven games, more story games where um, there is kind of this tyranny of the story anyway, or there is more back and forth and everything else. But when you have, and I like really tactical, tactically fun games, um, but when you have a group of characters who are working together and they're supposed to all be good at certain things, having the one character that's supposed to be good at, at fighting and they actually have crappy scores is very frustrating to, sure. to the players. Um, and so, yeah, could you entirely simplify the entire system where it's all like, okay, you're a fighter, you're good at this and good at this and sort of port this and port this. But even a point by system allows people to play um, uh, characters that are a little bit different uh, different than the, than the mode. Yeah, you might, you, you might search for that 18, but every once in a while you're like, you know, the difference between having an 18 and having a 17 is just one. So maybe I'll dump this a little bit and shore up some of my defenses here and play a totally different character. Um, so I think that's possible too. So maybe that's a, a sacred cow that I haven't killed yet. But yeah, I like scores. I like point by. I think you can have a diversity of characters. I think the diversity of characters more ha- in, in, in games is more about the choices you make about your character rather than what the actual numbers say. And stats won't make a player better. No. Oh, you hell know, no. So if you're a good player and you want to play a I, – I constantly go against type and roll up, uh, you know, unoptimized characters uh, because I just want to play something that's extra difficult to do. I feel sorry for my fellow players because I'm not probably holding up my end, but um, mm-hmm. I feel like my role-playing kind of hopefully overcomes most of that. 
my Living City character back in the second edition days was a dex based swashbuckling paladin of Mistra. And his stats sucked. <laughs> but, but he was so entertaining and so much fun, the GM would let me get away with crazy crap all the time. Yep. That's great. Yep. Well, it's like you're paying it forward. You're letting the GM, uh, it's almost like uh, you're, you're giving the GM a handle on you. But in exchange for that, you're providing a lot of entertainment to the GM. Yeah. So yeah, it's it's a it's a it's a a mutual agreement. <laughs> so. I, I, I won a joust once with uh, by leaping off my horse with my rapier. Nice. Yes. Yeah. Perfect. perfect. And I rolled shit, and they just let me get away with it because it was so <laughs> the visual was so cool. So, but those are you know that second edition, Living City <laughs> days. It's a very <laughs> different animal. <laughs> so I think we're gonna uh, so. We're going to pause just here for a second, just to do a quick station ID. Uh, we are here tonight with uh, Stephen Raddy McFarland and Beth Damus uh, talking about uh, freelancing, uh, creating, designing, all the things that go into creating a superior experience. Uh, I think this is a word that Stephen was using earlier. That's what I think we as GMs all want to create. We want to create a meaningful experience for people and to have that meaningful experience ourselves. So uh, you can catch uh, this show is going to be on later in the week on YouTube. You can find out more information on our social media. Check us out everywhere at Wizards on the Couch. And you can find us here next Monday. We're not skipping a week because we're crazy. We're going right ahead. We're going to have another guest, uh, twitch.tv slash Wizards of the Couch. I hope no one from legal is listening. We're on Spotify, because right, Brian? We are on Spotify. Spotify and yes, yeah, Brian, tell us all the other places. Yeah. YouTube. That's it. Spotify. That was it. Um, Google was, Music. From Google, right? Yep. yep. Google Play Store. Yep. yep. Mm -hmm. On the Googles. We're on the Googles. We're in development. We're trying it all. It's like a cornucopia. <laughs> Ooh, good word. Big so word. Uh, we're going to talk now. We're going to go over to Matt. We've got some questions from the couch. Uh, for uh, from Matt, and uh, these were picked up on social media either during the broadcast or prior in the week. Um, we're going to get a little more diligent about that too. Um, our social media stuff is just kind of revving up, and we all have like other things we're doing, so it's not always as organized as we'd like to be. But we really tag like us. to start. What's that? Yell at us, tag us, ask those yeah, questions. Us, yeah, like us, share us. But we're going to put out some questions to hopefully generate some more interesting questions for the couch. So take it away, Matt. I didn't see any questions pop up tonight uh, in the chat, so I have two that I have diligently uh, dug for through all of the entirety of the internet. <clears throat> Darnell H, uh, who won our is that, yeah, thanks for the motions. Darnell H, uh, who won our Wizards of the Couch mug, for his question this week that I found. Uh, his mug went out on Tuesday and should be getting it, I think, Monday probably. I don't have it with me. Oh, that's foul. Darnell, so, man, fire us a shot on Insta. I want to see yeah. you drinking something potent out of that mug. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So his question was, how do I speed up my players so we can actually complete what I have planned as a game master during a session? And I will toss that over to uh, let's talk over to Brian <laughs> first. That's Beth. Man, I wasn't listening to a word you said. I, I, was, I was talking to uh, our, our people on Twitch. What, what was your question, Matt? Trained professionals. It's all right. Because I think <laughs> Stephen, uh, we'll go. We'll go over to Stephen first. With how do I speed up my players so I can accomplish what I planned uh, during a game session? Uh, copious amounts of caffeine. Um, maybe something harder. I don't know. Uh, I mean, speed up your players. Uh, there's a bunch of s sort of things like roll damage with you know, your attack rolls, sometimes that doesn't work. It works. Sometimes it doesn't. Um, uh, no, no cell phones at the table. That's a pretty good rule. Um, it, hard to enforce these days. Uh, uh, throw something in their way really quick, something big and dangerous. That'll light a fire under their ass. No, and he, he sometimes helps us cheat, I guess. Because Julie and I are novices. We do stupid shit like, oh, there's a there's a trap door. Okay, let's just go straight the fuck down it. And he'll he'll make suggestions on better ways that we could 
interact hey, with our surroundings. Railroad. Like, Railroad. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, Danny knows how I'll answer the question. How do I speed my games up, Danny? Uh, you railroad them. No, I kill them. Oh, oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> you railroad them to death. I just kill the player. <laughs> hey, you die. <laughs> One less person to worry about. Hey. Stephen also true. threw a bunch of NPCs in our way that could join us on our adventure because it's just Julie and I. So now I think there's four people because the fifth one just died. Yeah. Uh, I keep seeing death notices from some of your some of those players. I will have or to uh, defer to the um, uh, the wisdom of Gygax on that one because we're doing Village of Hamlet right now. So and mm -hmm. there's a bunch of NPCs that you can pick up. Some are helpful, some are not. Um, luckily, the <laughs> non-helpful one has, was the one who got his face not off by zombies, so. Mm. Yeah. Okay. All right, Brian. So, uh, actually, I'm, I'm you gonna know jump what? back in. No, no, I won't, no, go don't. ahead. After you, you jump, you jump. No, no, go ahead. We're gonna go pass ahead. the torch? Jump, jump. I, I was okay. gonna pass to, to pass you. The torch. Yeah. It's, it's here. Okay. I'm going to go running. No, um, I would say actually by empowering your players and make them do a lot of the work that you would do normally as a game master. So that way you can concentrate on moving the game along. You, you're kind of the bottleneck. We often think it's the players, but that's not quite the truth. Um, the game master is the one who's running the game, right? Uh, and so if you are freed up, to make things move along and, and help facilitate the game, oftentimes that's better. So get one of your players to track initiative. Get one of your players to you know do all these you know minuscule tasks that you might normally be holding on to. They become more engaged. They become more into the game, um, and then you're free to to run it and tell a better story and not be bogged down by all the the things that you have to do as a game master. I don't want to do that shit, Stephen. So Beth say, is that now is tracking an initiative. initiative. No, nope. I think That's you know. Like, I I think I I do That's some really of that stuff really with really my group, cool. but but what's really helped me is realizing that the the history of D and D almost treated things like you were supposed to present everything as a mystery. There's a mm -hmm. doorknob. Ooh, is it a mimic? Is it a thing? Is it connected to a spear trap? You know, everything is life with this danger, right? But a lot of the game is very satisfying when you're not making everything a mystery. So I just make some things just very clear choices. Mm. You've come to the end of the path. You can either scale down the cliff, jump across the waterfall, or figure out a way to fly. So then, the, then I back away from the players, and they have a couple minutes to talk. But they know what they're dealing with. They just have to decide, are we dexterous enough to jump as a group? Do we have enough magic to fly? Can any of us fucking swim? Like now they have a set of decisions to make that are more compact. And then later when they're, you know, in the Indiana Jones Temple of Doom and they're like clicking out the artifacts, they can worry about those things at a different time. But I find it's just easier to give them real clear goals, but they have to have choices that are meaningful. Yeah, that's pretty solid. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I think probably one of the most, uh, yeah, maybe not critical, but probably one of the most um, uh, apparent people that are in the uh, chat here is probably Jimmy, who is on a set schedule with Twitch, right? So it's a little bit more difficult to keep the uh, keep the ball rolling in Twitch. So how do you? What are the things that you mm -hmm. use to manage the players speed? Time? My players up, yeah. Um, <clears throat> a lot of time, it, it, yeah. You put. Uh, on a timer and actually one of the little we got oh, wow. a little, little extension that is now in the combat tracker and you click it and it starts ticking down and they know then wow. uh, that it's you know and I haven't had to use it a lot um, but there've been a couple of times other than that I, I, it's I'm I, it's I, it's a running joke but if they are stuttering along too too much there's the dice roll in the tower and they will see the shadows going on in the background that I'm rolling on something and they go uh oh what was that for and yeah I play crickets yeah there's some crickets and then 
I will, I will slap somebody. And I mean, what I mean by that is I will hit, somebody's going to get hit in the game. They're going to get, and it's not, it's death is not, is, is a running joke, but they will, something will happen to them. And now all of a sudden they've spent too much time, uh, chatting about it and it's time to move on and something bad will happen because if you're doing, you know, I think if you're down in the dungeon and you're flapping your lips a lot, you're going to attract some attention down there somewhere. So, yeah. You're forcing sure. action. I'm forcing the action. I'll force it. And it's, that's, I do it all the time. And I've got plenty of the players in here that are watching that will tell you that I do it a lot. So, yeah. yeah so we have, uh, we have a plan, um, uh, one of the shadow or shadow run, sorry, one of the Pathfinder uh, <laughs> series, not even the kind of the same game. And um, we have managed the last two encounters, last two uh, books rather, have managed to like pull almost the entire dungeon because just like you were saying, Jimmy, we're like flapping our gums, just kind of wasting our time. And all of a sudden <laughs> we gave enough time for the uh, guys in the next room to, to, to hear the alarm. It's been, it's been terrible. Uh, my, my comments on the, um, uh, on the question were a little more ephemeral, I guess, in that as the game master, you should set your expectations you shouldn't set your expectations on what you're going to get to, right? So uh, if you have a overarching plan and don't be disappointed, Daryl, uh, or Darnell, I'm sorry, Darnell, don't be disappointed if you don't get to that end point. Like you are presenting the story and you're presenting the adventure to your, to your players. They're there to have a good time. If they don't make it to your, to your uh, line in the sand, it's not the end of the world. So uh, yeah, I, I don't think that s set those expectations either lower or don't set them at all, whatever it is. So it's, you more or less object to the idea of speeding up the players, let them do what yeah. they want. That was my, that was my comments on it. Yeah. 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 That's, I, that's I like good. that. So I actually, I don't think quickly until it comes to business business. I can make decisions super fast. Um, and emotion stresses me out severely. So if we're in a battle or an uncomfortable situation, I move much slower. And I'm, I'm grateful that Stephen lets me go through it. If there was an egg timer, I'd probably just get up and go do something else. Right. <laughs> I, I've, had, I've had players at my table uh, tell me, you know, like I'd be hurrying them along. And one of the women who played with me several years ago, she doesn't play with me anymore. She said, listen, I want to come up with a solution. I don't want to fight. Yeah. If, if we were going to fight, then it's very important for us to like rush forward, roll dice and pull out our swords and do all sorts of crazy mm -hmm. action. But we're not going to fight these things. We're going to try to figure out a way around them. So back off. You know, she, I mean, she yeah. was more polite than that, but she just said, dude, let us have our own solution. We're not in any danger. You don't have to push us into this fight, right? I'm like, no, you're right. Fine. You know, and it was a great session. So I I've noticed a lot of my a lot of my players feel the same as you do. Like they don't want to be pressurized. It's an enjoyable right. pursuit. That's uh yeah, so in the interest of time, that's what we had uh for questions from the couch this evening. And that was a good question. I I like it. Yep. Yeah. Good discussion. Good I like I think that we that all don't really agree. Good. Those are the yeah. best questions. Yeah. We've got a lot here. Um, uh, there's four of us, each, you know, very veteran game masters, and we often have very different uh, techniques yeah. and ways yeah, we of doing do. things. <laughs> and that goes to, goes to show that, you know, just because you're on the internet and loud doesn't mean that you're right. Jimmy. Yeah, Jimmy. <laughs> I, I have to say <laughs> that while yeah. Jimmy's Jimmy's play style is one that I that I would have a hard time doing myself, he's running a computer, he's running a camera, he's doing I mean yeah, he is sure. producing an event in addition to running a game. I yeah. mean, I hats off all the time to Jimmy. I don't know how you do it, man. Alcohol. <clears throat> yeah. <All right. laughs> Social <Copious>. lubricant. <laughs> And we're still trying to get these two on a game. We're going to lasso them sooner or later. So yeah, we will figure it out. Well, now I'm freaked out. I don't want to play your fucking game. you got an egg timer. Egg timer. <laughs> Just for you'll you. Another one. It'll, it'll say it. Beth's timer. Beth, Beth, you can come play in my timer. game, and you'll okay. have all the time you need. Okay. And 
You'll have you know tons of homegirls to play me. with. You... I am totally fine with the egg timer. I just won't use it on her. She'll just something will just come up. I just get her unlimited litter. time. Yeah, you just get hit, and, it's, and she'll, then she'll yell. At <laughs> no. Uh -huh. well, we're gonna get him on a show. We're gonna we're gonna wrangle him. Yeah, they, they promised. I'm down. Uh, although I, I, I do have to admit I've got a lot of uh, game invites right now. Yeah. We'll get, Everybody's we'll get all to like, yeah. Steven's not working. And yeah. I'm like, no, actually I am. I'm working twice as hard. Thank you very much. No, it's it's been really awesome watching him find the love for the game again. While he was working, he was also doing freelance. And he, he didn't have time to be social or to play games. And now... Seeing him get involved with more games, and he's gonna he's gonna run a Delve game regularly, and just enjoying games again. Yep, it's been yep. really nice. I, I, I mentioned him today, like I haven't seen you stressed or sad since you left, and it's well. That that's a question you said really in the videos. Nice. Have you recorded any of that Delve gameplay anywhere, Stephen, so people can? No, see I have not. Yeah. So. I'm and usually just because uh, a lot of times when I'm running it at conventions, I want to stay in the moment, right? Mm -hmm. I want to yeah. see how how people do it. I don't uh, I, or how people react to things. Um, uh, there, there. I I will freely admit there is a big part of me that uh, I'm as as the person that I am. Uh, that I, I I really kind of wonder about all of these you know uh, play videos and whatnot uh i am I, I was the kind of kid that i would love to play backyard football but i don't want to watch football games and uh, you know so I, I tend to not think about any of that stuff when i'm playing yeah. or running a game sure. um yeah. and even like even when i would run stuff on the paizo stream uh or or do things like that i just like i just ignored the camera i just Right. I'm just playing a game. So, um, and uh, the best so, way to do it. Yeah. yeah, I, yeah. I think so. Sometimes, uh, sometimes the people I worked with, I think got a little grumpy about that. you got to play up to the camera and I'm like, mm, do you, do you really? No, no you don't because <laughs> yeah. authenticity, authenticity is the currency. Yeah. So if you're, if you're an authentic person and you're really doing your best, people, people are magnetically attracted to it. There's no doubt. Yeah. I think that's one reason that AI has been so successful. The people that you see on camera are not playing characters. It's not scripted. They are completely shocked when shit comes their way. Super <laughs> excited for PAX West because I know some secrets that are going to just fuck people over. It's very exciting. But Steven ran a game on Club PA, a Pathfinder game, and the, the players loved it so much they have their characters up in their offices. Wow. Yeah. Oh, that yeah. is awesome! That's nice. Yeah, that was a fun game. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Pax West, Beth. Did you have any? Uh, did you have any insider scoop on what's coming up on Pax West? At Pax West, there is so much crazy shit coming down for Penny Arcade. It's insane, and I wish they hadn't told me what it was because I have to remember that I can't say to you what it is. Um, but Penny Arcade is expanding our partnerships and doing some really amazing shit in the next year. Uh, we actually went to Gen Con for the first time. Ever and had a booth this last year. You had a selfie, and it was. Did you send me a selfie? Yeah. Oh, I'm hurt. I had a picture. I oh, took a picture sorry. outside your booth. James mm -hmm. did. I, I did see his selfie. Yeah, I, I did. See that. I, I took a picture of Eric Frank House, which goes to show like how screwed up I was. <laughs> send them to me because I want to see them all. But but it was it was extremely successful. There was a whole bunch of people that didn't know what we did that that got information. Apparently, our DM screen was. The most successful product because it is literally garbage it's just running jokes it won't help you run a game whatsoever and so That's people insane. were just buying it like crazy because dm screens are taken so fucking seriously by everybody else so we'll probably do gen con again good Noted. we'll be there mm -hmm. drinks on the patio outside the omni at 2 a.m that's yeah. where the real oh that happens. is the place to be yeah that is where mm -hmm. that is where we are every year so after I, the call like a when i say we round. i don't mean me i i've heard steven's gen con stories and gen con scares the shit out of me there's a lot of people there, there it is people. not it is not it is not for the faint of heart on opening morning yes. yeah so he would send me pictures of the doors opening and the people running towards the pies of the <laughs> yeah. i took my wife beth and she already wants to book her room for next year She's not a gamer really? like oh, you. Wow. She's not a gamer like you at all. 
So I'm just letting you know. That oh, I'm such a gamer. Yeah, but I, you know what? I, I'm okay. I'm sorry. I said that wrong. Okay. You know, <laughs> you know, the, well, if I go, I can hang out with your wife. So she wants to go again. So. Wow. <laughs> so the one cool thing about PAX West is we are going to have 30 GMs running 12 tables of AI the whole show. Awesome. Wow. A little That's... disorganized play. <laughs> I think it's going to be fairly organized. Yeah, I keep thinking yeah. that I want to start something for the, all the rebels who don't want organized play. We'll just call it disorganized play. But I guess that's just open tables, which don't exist at cons anymore. No, they do. Oh, they do. In, they do. In fact, Stephen will be at West, and I would love to see him run a game of Delver too while he's there. Yeah, I'd definitely do that. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Okay, well, hey, we good. have come to the end of yet another uh, – evening of Wizards of the Couch. And uh, I would just like to thank both Stephen and Beth for taking time out, for being here together, coordinating all this with Jimmy and making sure that we could have a, a really in-depth conversation about design, about the things we love, about our best experiences in this, uh, in this industry, and uh, learning a little bit that there's lots of cool stuff coming from PAX. It's going to be great. Um, those who can attend, please uh, check out links. I'm sure we'll get links down in the doobly-doo. Um, so I also just wanted to say that uh, we had a really great uh, uh, time at Gen Con. I know we're not going to get into everything there, but we met with some folks at World Anvil, and they were very excited to be there at Gen Con, and we got to learn a lot about what, what, what their Project Deos, Dungeon Fog, World Anvil. I recommend you look it all up. Google World Anvil, Dungeon Fog, Project Deos. Learn about it. And, uh, and support them because they are doing some really great things for world builders and world building. Um, $420,000 was the close of their Kickstarter. Nice. Yeah. So they just closed a, a really positive chapter, and I have it straight from the folks who are running the show over there that big things are coming. And, uh, and uh, the Wizards want to obviously uh, promote that as much as we can. Also, we want you to go and check out uh, Delve RPG. We want you to check out Acquisition Incorporated, all the cool stuff from Penny Arcade. Uh, Steven, Beth, thank you so much. Yep. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. It's fun. You guys are our gamer family. Hope to see you again very, very soon. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. We'll absolutely. Kibbled That's KibboldCon.com. <laughs> And for people oh, out there who don't know, uh, Gamehole Con is coming up on Halloween this year in Madison, Wisconsin. Be there. We will. We're going to be running a ton of games. And Gary Con in the spring, and I don't know what else we're doing in between. We'll put up a schedule at some yep. point. We're not that organized. So. All right, Disorganized folks. play. Thanks Good for night. watching. We'll see you all later.